intimidating room. I, I just need to make sure I may have lost my PowerPoint. Oh, that's it. Sorry. No, that's it. It's there and waiting. Um, I'm a Mac person, so give me a chance. Yeah. There we go. All right. Um, I teach, um, I'm a professor at Eckerd College, and so I talk for a living. Um, they asked me to keep this to 15 minutes, so I'm going to do my darndest um, to be as succinct as I possibly can. What I want to do is tell you a little bit about this new organization um, that I founded and that I direct now here in St. Petersburg, the Edible Peace Patch Project, um, a literal tongue twister, always fun to say. Um, let's, let's see. Now, since 2009, we have installed and run uh, educational schoolyard gardens. Right now, we've got four schoolyards, and these are the four that we're working in. Lakewood Elementary, Maximo, Sanderlin Ivy, World School, and Campbell Park Elementary. As Tuesday mentioned, these are all Title I schools. Um, Title I means 60% or more, 62%. It depends on the district. They set the margin. But uh, a majority of students are on free and reduced lunch um, at all. All of these schools. So I'm, I'm growing gardens. We are growing gardens. Um, only I'm, a, I'm an environmental historian. I came to St. Petersburg to teach history in the environmental studies program and environmental literature in the environmental studies program. I'm kind of a bookish scholar. I write books. Um, in fact, my first book is coming out in July. Please do buy it. Um, <laughs> It's a history of 19th century mining, though. And so the question is, why am I growing gardens? Why, why is this happening? And I think um, it's important to understand why it's happening, um, to understand what the Peace Patch is all about. Um, in part, it's happening, in large part, it's happening because I came to St. Petersburg in 2006 as a scholar, an environmental scholar, who's very interested in combining environmental issues, save the birds and the trees and the parks and keep the water clean and the air clean, and social issues. Um, how do we prevent dropout rates? How do we deal with and address some of the impacts of poverty and those types of things? I think as a scholar that they're the same issue. But I think we have for a long time thought of them as separate issues. So I came here with an ambition to do something in the kind of Gandhian tradition, which essentially means I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, but I knew that I was going to do something, and it was going to combine these two issues. Um, and so I came to St. Petersburg in 2006, and I started looking around. And as it turns out, there are social issues in St. Petersburg, social issues in Pinellas County. Um, poverty. I don't have to tell anybody in this room about the issues that we face in Pinellas County. Um, and we all know as well that these poverty issues overlap with race in some challenging ways for our community. Um, and then the year that I arrived, this statistic was all over the place. 70% um, of uh, the African American males who should have, 70% did not graduate from high school in 2006. And I would just suggest that this is one of those places in our community where poverty and race actually intersect most forcefully. It's actually, it can make it a leverage point as well, which is the way I've ultimately approached it. Um, what that meant, though, was that we show up on the national map uh, as a community. We show up on the national map up there with Detroit and New York and Baltimore. Um, and so, I looked around in 2006, 2007, and here was this really obvious social issue. Um, and one that as an educator I could actually understand, I could get my head around. We have a dropout problem, um, a significant dropout problem. And there's a, it's a simple challenge, ultimately, as an educator. Um, the challenge is, how do you get kids to sick to school? How do you get them to see that school is valuable for their future? And that's the, that is the missing piece a lot of times in these dropout rates. And it overlaps with poverty, overlaps with racism, and overlaps with a whole lot of other issues. Um, but ultimately, it's a simple issue. How do we get our kids to stay in school? Um, something that's very, very important. St. Petersburg is on another national map. Um, and this is a map that's put together by the, University, uh, the United States Department of Agriculture. This is a map of food deserts 
Um, and this is based on census data from 2010. This is the south part of Pinellas County, St. Petersburg. We've got a number of food deserts. Food desert is a designation, a geographical designation that says you live in an urban area and there is not a supermarket, a full service supermarket for more than a mile. It's a question of access, a question of geographical um, access. Um, and here, we've, I've just added for the sake of kind of understanding this, our full service supermarkets on the south side. Um, we have three publics, one in downtown, two remarkably surviving almost a thousand yards from each other on the corner of 34th and 54th. And we have Walmart, which has a full service supermarket. And then we have the Sweet Bays. And if you've been paying attention to the news, you know that um, we no longer have the Sweet Bays. And so the geography of our food desert on the south side has actually expanded um, as a result of this. Um, larger food desert striking these regions. So we've got this dropout rate and we've got food deserts. And both of them, from my perspective as a social scientist, are the results of poverty. These are things we see when we deal with the economics of poverty itself. Um, and so uh, in 2009, after three years of living here in St. Petersburg and moving into the South Side and participating a bit in the community, I created um, and began at the urging of a number of my students at Eckerd College, um, the first Peace Patch Garden, and that's what's going on there up on the top there. Uh, January 2009, basically to address the dropout rate and to address the food desert issue. And food deserts, as you well know, there are huge nutritional issues. People are eating too much sugar, too much salt, um, we have obesity and diabetes kind of out of control at this point because the food that is available is no good. So um, students found out, I've kind of got an interesting background. My parents went back to the land in the 1970s, took me with them, and so I grew up on a sustainable farm in Massachusetts, um, something I hated, I loathed it. It was far too much work, I don't recommend it for anybody. Um, but my students found out that I knew how to grow and they said, please teach us. There's a whole new generation of young people who want to grow gardens. And they just appeared out of nowhere about five years ago. Um, and I said, well, OK, I can teach you how to grow food. Um, and let's also, at the same time, see if we can address a social issue. Let's see if we can put this into a schoolyard that might not ordinarily have it and do mentoring and do um, academic support. And so through the spring of 2009, we installed this garden in January 2009 and then we went through the mentoring program with the county all of my students did and we began mentoring fifth graders um, first and then worked with fifth graders who worked with kindergarten and first graders and we began doing some environmental education and then some science education we looked at the standards and said well how can we just do some support out here with the stuff that they need to know and we did nutrition and talked to them about food and eating um, and we also kind of cultivated not necessarily intentionally the sense of place. So my example of that is I was out picking some seeds off of a cilantro bush late in the spring of 2009 and I heard this yell from the other side of the fence. These third graders, hey, what are you doing in my schoolyard? What are you doing in my garden? They saw it, they, they see it as theirs. Their sense of place in the schoolyard was developed fairly robustly. Um, so it was an amazing spring semester and at the end of it we said, well, let's celebrate. Let's, let's have a harvest festival. And this was a school where when we would have a PTA meeting, we were lucky if one or two families came out. And we called this Harvest Festival and we crossed our fingers and more than 200 people showed up. Um, parents brought their kids, kids brought their parents. Kids who raved about working in the schoolyard, growing this vegetable, and this is some of the bounty that we had. My students from Eckerd College prepared dishes based on the food that came out of the garden and we served up a home-cooked meal um, to a cafeteria, um, first a garden full of people and then a cafeteria full of people. Um, the, the chorus sang the garden song. It was a really, it was a wonderful evening. And we kind of, I kind of realized at that point that we were on to something that was clicking, that, that there was community coming out of this, the kids were learning, they were choosing the vegetables, eating the vegetables, etc. cetera. Um, we also, <laughs> this is kind of cool and symbolic, we are on Google Earth, <laughs> we, so we exist. Um, it's cool because those satellites are taking pictures all the time, and so something I did in the landscape 
appears um, for anyone to see. But it's symbolic because it actually does, by being on Google Earth and kind of having this presence, um, symbolizes this permanence that we've tried to build around what we're doing. We've built a 12-week program now where we put volunteers into the schoolyard with the same class and the same kids all semester long just doing academic support. We are connecting mentoring and learning rooted in education. We're trying to do something not just pretty um, and, and helpful. I grew up on the farm, I didn't like it, but growing, learning those things is an impo are important lessons, but also connected to the educational needs of the school itself. So principals go, this is good, this is, this is okay. Um, we are actually seeing results already. We've seen the science scores go up at two schools. We're seeing kids stay in school who statistically, we would say we don't expect them to. They're in their sophomore years now, the kids who went through our original program. Um, we are seeing some improvements in math and reading as well. We have yet to do a robust measurement of this, but data from around the country shows that these things work, that the experiential education and the connections and all of that are helping kids learn, uh, which is ultimately what we are all about. And so we did this for a couple of years and uh, just in this Lakewood schoolyard. And then in 2011, I was foolishly talked into expanding my volunteer activities from one schoolyard to actually forming a 501c3. And so we formed, uh, we, we organized ourselves as an organization and we developed a mission that I'm gonna talk a little bit about. And we went out and saw to see if we could raise some money. Um, and we actually were quite successful. We raised money from the USF St. Pete Learn and Serve grant. And in January 2012, we had more than 140 volunteers show up for a Saturday morning to turn this grassy yard um, into this. And I'll talk a little bit about what's going on there. Um, turn Sanderlin, the yard of Sanderlin, into a um, our second Peace Patch Garden, also on Google Earth. <laughs> I'm really proud of the Google Earth presence. Uh, if you can't quite see it, it's not trying to look like a crop circle. It's actually a water molecule. Uh, but the second atom sits underneath the tree there. Um, and then we ran two gardens in 2012 and realized that we were really onto something and we continued to do some fundraising and managed to raise money from the Raise Community Foundation. And last January, um, January 2013, Brandon Gomes and Alex Cobb showed up and helped us install our garden at Campbell Park Elementary and worked with the kids there. And again, turning this grassy yard um, into a Peace Patch schoolyard garden. And we raised money from the Tampa JCs and were able to install a fourth garden, also in January of 2013. We were doing two gardens at once at one point, uh, which was <laughs> managing a lot of volunteers. Everybody wanted to be with the Rays. Um, and, and, but we managed to get them in and installed. Um, now, I wanted to say a couple things about what we're actually doing there. Uh, when we first, when I first put the Lakewood Garden in, I dug a little bit into the ground and then I bought all this topsoil and I filled up my beds with topsoil and we grew through the spring, things grew great. And then I went away for the summer and I came back in August and it was all sand. I had no topsoil left. And I did it again the second year, dug it all out, put the topsoil in. The, you can see the base of what we got here, not the brown stuff, but the white stuff. We are one big heap of sand, is what the peninsula is. It's sugar sand, <coughs> large pieces, <coughs> big spaces between topsoil washes away into the aquifer. It disappears. We were wasting money, um, and it wasn't making any sense, and our vegetables weren't very good the second year either. Um, so we got looking around for some strategies and we came across this what, what's called permaculture technique uh, called Hugel culture, which is done in Germany to uh, for water conservation reasons. It holds a lot of water essentially. These are usually built on top of the ground. Uh, what we decided to try here was to do them down in the ground. And so we excavate every single one of our beds about three and a half feet. We put this um, essentially waterproof roofing material, very expensive stuff, create a basin on the bottom, fill it with mulch and water because it doesn't rain in the right season here. This holds tremendous amounts of water on the bottom. Seasoned logs, more mulch, fish, which is actually fantastic fertilizer, which you can also use um, any kind of organic material. More mulch, soil builder, 
shrimp for nematodes and topsoil. And then here's my uh, technical <laughs> drawing of the cross-section <laughs> of the blue culture. Um, it will actually shrink about two feet through the first season as everything starts to break down. But essentially, good soil is, is living stuff. It's filled with bacteria um, and, and microorganisms, and that's what makes for healthy soil. So we put all the ingredients together, and then we grow it underneath. And our crops are looking better this year than they ever have. I've got corn this high, and I haven't seen corn more than a foot high since I started growing in St. Petersburg. And they're producing a lot of vegetables, et cetera. So our gardens um, are, are rich, um, and this technique seems to be working. It's, it's, Hugel culture literally means hill culture, so in, in German. So this technically should be called Lok culture, but I was talked out of changing the name because Hugel culture is what the permaculture people understand. But this is our technique, Lok, Lok culture. Um, and we'd be happy to teach you how to do it anywhere where you want to put in the garden. This is the way to grow in Pinellas County. Um, so in these enhanced garden beds that we've developed, um, we have developed this program. Um, where we, well, first of all, in the beds themselves, we are growing 35 different uh, vegetables, fruits, and herbs. So we get the whole cross section of your specialty crops out there. Um, we, in growing them, offer this 12 week program that consists of putting community volunteers and student volunteers with elementary school students. And we do it over a longer period of time so that you get that mentoring relationship, that longer term relationship that makes the mentoring experience actually um, work to get the traction that it needs to have. Um, we are offering academic support in these mentoring relationships in the sciences, in mathematics, in language arts. We are teaching nutrition. We have a wellness program where we're, we're harvesting and teaching the kids how to prepare the food. And we're teaching leadership skills and soft sort of educational skills as well. So com college students, community volunteers, Title I elementary students, all organized around community gardening. And we're doing the gardening in order to cultivate this community. We're doing the gardening to teach lessons about sustainability and to build social capital. Um, our overarching goal is to develop social capital on the south side through this food system um, intervention. And so this is a little bit about our, our larger plan, and then I will stop. And I'm, I'm just a couple minutes over. I'm doing okay. Almost done. We've got four gardens in the dark green. We've got funding for four more that we want to put in. Um, and we are in the process of developing program funding to run all of these. Because as it turns out, it's not mathematical, it's exponential. <laughs> Each new garden comes with a whole new set of challenges. Um, and so as we're growing into ourselves, we're realizing um, our programming is very important, making sure we've got our programming um, supported. Our larger goal, though, is to do what we are calling a food system intervention um, in the south side. We want to create a farm to plate urban agriculture system that is designed as a nonprofit to address the impacts of poverty, to address the dropout rate, both in the schoolyard gardens and in an urban farm that we'd like to do to help get GEDs and get high school diplomas completed, um, to address the nutrition issue by providing fresh, local, and abundant food in the school cafeterias, um, by developing executive skills um, in the kids that are, we are working with, and soft skills, showing up on time, um, knowing how to take responsibility for one's responsibilities, etc. cetera. Um, and, and we hope to cultivate an entrepreneurial spirit through all of this. Um, we are looking to build a farm on the south side, and these are just a couple of locations that have enough open space at this point. South Side Junior High School, um, there's about four and a half, five acres back there that could be a farm. Right now, the 4th Street Bridge is being reconstructed, so there's construction equipment all over this site. This would be a nice site as well, about four acres there. Our dream location, though, and it is yet to be developed, so I keep my fingers crossed, is down here in Lake Magori, 15 acres of open space. This is an open space opportunity that it would be a shame for St. Petersburg to pass up. It's not going to happen. Again, 15 acres, and of course I would love to turn it into a farm <laughs> and to preserve it as a farm and put in a 15 acre farm. Um, 
The overall vision for the Edible Peace Patch Project is to use these schoolyard gardens to teach about the nutrition, to create a demand for the local food that we will grow on the farm, prepare in a culinary institute, and sell back to the schools, um, as well as other institutions as a sort of local food source. That's a revenue source to help cover some of our operating funds. Um, and then the whole thing is designed for education. It's ultimately designed to address dropout rates, um, community capital, uh, community skill building, and ultimately we hope economic development in what I believe is emerging, a green economy that's out there, these are green economy skills. So over the next decade, we'd like to create a farm to plate system whose components connect Southside kids to education and to self-development because we want to put St. Petersburg on a new national map, a map that celebrates our ability to creatively solve our social and environmental challenges instead of continuing to bemoan the things we haven't achieved. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? I'm just curious how many times you can use that Hugo culture, how many years, but on the big, my bigger question, I wondered where you are in stages of getting permission to use that ideal site. Like, what are the steps you need to take? What can the community do to help promote that? Uh, well, I mean, I, I keep talking about it. I'm trying to get the city aware of it. Um, I have talked to the developer who owns it. He wants a lot of money for it. If anybody knows him, <laughs> he would be happy to name the farm after him. <laughs> so it's it's a it is a pie, it's a dream at this point, but it's a dream that is still an opportunity. And if there were a way to make it work, so for example, we talked to him about holding on to the waterfront, so five acres on either side, and, and just doing the middle section. Um, as the market gets better, the real estate market gets better, it becomes a harder sell. Other questions? Thanks. Well, I just want to thank you.